hesitate to ask questions, just unmute your mic and uh, go ahead and ask. Uh, this is something that I think you might have uh, seen uh, or read before. Uh, of course, this is, I have heard it from CVK saying that it's uh, Niels Bohr used to write it down on the board, but maybe there are many other people who have, uh, you know, uh, said this. Maybe he's not the first one. So there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers. So if you ask a question where I'm not uh, very sure of the answer, uh, I will I will uh, try not to give a stupid answer, but uh, to try to say that okay, I'll go back and get back to you. I'll uh, learn uh, something. Sir, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, sir uh, can I turn off the video because I have uh, limited mobile data? So sure, 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 sure. No, no, absolutely. You can do that. No, I, I just actually, I mean, you could, uh, whoever doesn't have the bandwidth is free to turn off the video. Okay. Okay. So, this is an overview of uh, what I plan to do. Uh, first of all, I will uh, say something about measurements in physics. I think today's lecture will be mainly on that. Uh, then, uh, uh, for instance, the power of dimensional arguments, and I will give the example of uh, you know, the estimate of the neutrino cross section for that. Order of magnitude estimates, the so called Fermi estimates. But, uh, uh, I mean, there is a series of articles by Edward Purcell, who got the Nobel Prize for uh, his uh, work on the nuclear magnetic resonance. And he wrote a series of articles on these uh, Fermi type of questions, Fermi estimate questions in the American Journal of So, anyway, so I, this, is, this is quite important, and I thought I would cover that as part of it. Then I will say something about measurement techniques. Uh, and this will be sort of fairly general, but uh, many of them will be focusing on the things that we do in uh, particle and nuclear physics. Then I will talk about some classic experiments. Uh, and uh, some of them are listed here. Of course, as we go along, I, I might put in uh, something else and take out uh, something from this list. But at least the list that I have thought of is the following. Uh, Rutherford's uh, experiment to uh, no, uh, give evidence for a compact nucleus in, a, in an atom. And uh, this actually uh, led to rest uh, Thompson's model of a, uh, that pi kind of model in which there are uh, various electron functions. So there is a positive charge background of an electron. So, uh, because the Rutherford experiment is a kind of generic experiment. And a similar kind of uh, philosophy was also used in finding point-like objects in a nucleon, namely the quarks. Okay, then I will say something about the exponential decay law. It's a very I mean, general kind of uh, behavior of decaying systems. Uh, then I will come to discovery of uh, some of the early particles that uh, you know were responsible for uh, our understanding of uh, nature as we know it now. Of course, since that time, many, many more uh, particles, most of them composites, have been discovered. Uh, so I will talk about the discovery, the early ones, the, the discovery of the positron, muon, pion. Uh, then I will talk about the first evidence for the elusive neutrino, uh, about uh, parity violation in beta decay uh, or in any weak interaction. Then discovery of CP violation. Then, as I said, uh, the uh, Rutherford experiment is quite uh, uh, I mean, generic in the sense that uh, a similar kind of uh, philosophy is used to get to the evidence for point-like objects in nucleons. Uh, and so, the deep inlessing scattering of electrons and protons and neutrons and so on. Then we come to the, uh, the experiment, the beautiful experiment, which showed evidence for the neutral current in weak interactions. Then the solar neutrino problem and the atmospheric neutrino problem. Then uh, the production and identification of the W. Okay, these are not necessarily in correct uh, historical order, but uh, more or less. So sometimes there might be a little change. Something might have come actually earlier than the right time. So production and identification of the vector bosons responsible for weak interactions, uh, intermediaries. For, uh, weak uh, force. Uh, precision measurements on the Z resonance by the uh, electron-positron collider in the so-called left tunnel, which uh, later, I'm sorry about the background, um, 
I mean, I don't have a uh, you know, soundproof room, unfortunately. So there is uh, you know, things on the road that might be a little disturbing. So precision measurements on the Z resonance by the electron positron collider at uh, CERN. Uh, now, of course, the, the lab head was dismantled and then uh, the LHC came in its place, the Large Hadron Collider. Then I'll say something about the discovery of neutrino oscillations, uh, how they change their flavor from one to the other, and then the uh, probabilities keep changing as the, the neutrino propagates, both in space and in matter. Uh, then I come to the discovery of the Higgs boson, and searches for beyond the standard model, smoking gun signals of various, various types, uh, particles, anomalies. I don't know how much I will be able to do, but maybe I can. I will perhaps take one or two examples. And, uh, well, on that. Okay. I also would like to emphasize in when we come to the experimental part, the role of technology in uh, in experiments. I mean, experiments drive technology. The modern day, you know, cutting edge kind of experiments, they drive technology. And in turn, uh, technology also makes it possible for some uh, cutting edge experiments to be done. Where technology not there, some experiments would not have been possible. And till that technology got developed, uh, the experiment would have to wait. Uh, on the other hand, some of the technology, cutting edge technology, also gets uh, done because there is a need for it in experiment. Uh, you perhaps are familiar with the, or at least have heard of uh, you know, the kind of superconducting magnets that are used uh, in the, the Large Hadron Collider. There are something like eight Tesla magnets. They were never, uh, I mean, made before. This, that was the first time that uh, such large magnets were made, dipole magnets were made. But they were necessary because it was, if you want to keep uh, you know, uh, the uh, protons on a path uh, within the left tunnel, then you have to bend them with a strong enough magnetic field. And so superconducting magnets were used, but the technology for making these eight Tesla superconducting magnets was absolutely the cutting edge at the time that it was made. Of course, now, since then, uh, technology has advanced even more and uh, people are already talking about a uh, you know, 100 kilometer uh, circumference accelerator and that will perhaps have uh, dipole magnets which have even uh, higher fields, perhaps uh, double or maybe two and a half times that uh, field of 8 Tesla, or maybe 16 or 20 Tesla. So this is the role of uh, experiment driving technology. But it's, it goes the other way around also. If there is a technology, for instance, silicon technology has impacted on experiment to a great extent. Uh, things have become much more compact. So earlier it was the transistor, then you had the integrated circuits, and then you had you know even more compact integrated circuits with you know finer uh, lines of uh, copper in. in or conductor with these chips. And uh, now I think they have gone to something like six uh, nanometers, and perhaps one day they'll go to the absolute limit of uh, which quantum mechanics will allow a uh, few nanometers. So, of course, you, you have to have a few atoms with that. So, uh, at some stage, uh, there has to be some jump coming from somewhere else. But this is how, uh, you know. These have also played a role in, uh, for instance, making experiments possible because if you have these compact uh, you know, integrated circuits, they can do wonders. They play a role in both control as well as uh, data acquisition, uh, as well as, you know, uh, processing of signals and whatnot. I mean, uh, computers, uh, so they, they're just uh, omnipresent. Okay, so I, I hope I've made my point that uh, technology and the experiment go hand in hand. Of course, yeah, this is, uh, I mean, I have uh, not said anything, anything about theory, but of course, theory and experiment have to go hand in hand. Uh, and uh, experiment uh, you know, drives new, new facts which come out from experiments, unexpected. They drive theory and theory, of course, forces experiment place to look for things that nobody had looked for before. So it, again, there, again, there is a synergy, it goes both ways from experiment to theory and theory to experiment. 
Okay, so I gave some references in this uh, slide. By the way, uh, you, uh, I will share this these slides in maybe a PDF form uh, with uh, all of you. I can send it to you by email, and so uh, this might be useful for you, perhaps. Okay, so some of the references which I have noted down here for uh, you know, uh, radiation detection detectors that are used in particle and nuclear physics. Uh, I put uh, right at the top a, a series of volumes by Bogdan Madlich. I don't know whether they are there in uh, the institute uh, for you to see. If they are, they are really a, I mean, these are very different kind of, uh, uh, this is a different volume, uh, uh, should I say. Uh, they are written in a very different way. It's not that traditionally you start out with some, you know, okay, a detector and then say how it works and this and that. These are kind of uh, more uh, a storytelling kind of approach, but he also, I mean, the, the, the writers in that, uh, quite often they are Nobel laureates and so on, quite a few of them are. And they write about what was the background to the experiment that they did, what are the difficulties they encountered, what were the physics goals that they had, and so on. So it's written in a very nice way and uh, almost like a story. It's very interesting to read. Uh, of course, the regular textbooks on uh, you know, the techniques of uh, nuclear and particle physics, there is a, a very nice compact book by Leo. Uh, there is a thicker volume, I think it is probably entered, if I am not mistaken, in fourth edition. Radiation detection measurement by Mall. Uh, then there are these other two volumes, uh, Introduction to Experimental Particle Physics by Fermo, Experiment Techniques in High Energy Physics by Perbel, the editor, so there are various people who have articles that. It's a world scientific publication. It's slightly dated because they're now 30 years old, but many of the uh, concepts, uh, they still hold. Of course, there are newer techniques now that have come, and for that, uh, I don't have, uh, if I if I get some recent uh, textbooks, I will I will uh, give those, I note them and give them to subsequent time. But, uh, of course, the most uh, uh, I mean, current things would be on the web. They would be in the form of journals. So, there is this journal, Nuclear Instruments and Methods, then the IEEE Nuclear Science Series, uh, then the proceedings in the various sector conferences, reports on progress and physics. These are volumes that come every year or so. And then the annual reviews in particle and nuclear science. So, this again comes every year. And this has a series of, you know, review articles. and. Uh, by written by the top uh, experts in that area. Of course, the particle uh, data handbook is also a very useful resource, and uh, so that also comes every, I think, couple of years or something. It's uh, published in, used to be published in PhysRevD or Physics Letters. Now, uh, the Chinese Journal of Physics also published it as far as I know. Uh, but it's there on the web. So, the, the lbl.gov. Uh, Website is there, you can get the latest uh, evaluation of particle data. But it also has very nice articles on how to detect particles, uh, you know, so statistical uh, you know, resource and uh, you know, properties about various materials and so on that are useful in, uh, to estimate various things. Uh, then there is another resource which is the CERN e resource, which is in the form of yellow books. I mean, when, they, when the World Wide Web was not there, there used to be these yellow books and uh, they would actually document the lectures or maybe notes that were uh, you know, circulated in Sun but also to a wide audience. And so now this is all on the web uh, and this is also a very useful resource. Okay, so now I, I come to uh, the, the first uh, part. Uh, namely on measurements in particle physics. So, I have, uh, uh, okay, I have given the reference here, some of the things here are both from the particle physics booklet as well as from Wikipedia. But uh, this is the rough plan. Uh, I will say uh, why, what and how of experiments and measurements. Uh, then uh, say a little bit about errors, uh, basically two types, statistical and systematic. Then I will highlight uh, the importance of calibration of instruments or apparatus. Uh, then units of measurement and standards. 
then say a little bit about backgrounds and interferences and uh, typical uh, physics experiment okay. uh, i think i have probably two of them so uh, for any of the hard sciences experiments and measurements are central okay. uh, you might have you know the the greatest uh, theory uh, the most beautiful theory uh, that uh, any theoretician can create uh, but if it is not backed up by experiment then there is a problem and uh, it is even worse if that experiment if an experiment is done and it shows that the predictions of that theory are wrong then of course that theory has to be thrown in the dustbin or you have to take some ideas from the theory and improve on that such that it matches experiments and measurements so uh, this is the difference actually between a uh, hard science and some of the other uh, you know investigations of the human mind like philosophy where mostly you are dealing with uh, thoughts of various kinds maybe very deep thoughts uh, but uh, in in these hard sciences like let's say physics chemistry or the life sciences and now probably the social sciences are also coming or maybe even economics there you have uh, actually data and you have to understand that in terms of uh, theoretical understanding and as i said it can go both ways uh, theory can predict something which can be checked by experiment if it, it is shown to be wrong and uh, proven to be so because of course sometimes experiments are also wrong uh, then you have to go back and modify your theory sometimes uh, you know uh, you have to have you have to make a big change in theory sometimes it might be a smaller change it depends on the kind of uh, uh, but also the other way okay typically we make uh, as i said measurements to verify certain predictions of theory and uh, you know sometimes you can if if the theory uh, is uh, something that can make very accurate predictions then you would also like to make measurements which are extremely accurate okay which are very precise and uh, uh to give you an example for instance the uh, the lamp shift uh, i think it has been measured to something like uh, uh, parts per million or even uh, even better accuracy than that uh, in the hydrogen atom but also in other atoms uh, not the same atoms and they these uh, measurements are actually borne out by uh, quantum molecular dynamics uh, calculations similarly the uh, you might have heard recently that the uh, magnetic moment of the muon has been measured to great accuracy and uh, this does not quite agree with the prediction that we uh, of uh, theory and uh, the uncertainty mainly has to do with uncertainties in the qcd corrections to the muon magnetic moment. so that there is some debate going on between theorists uh, there are some uh, theorists uh, theoretical groups i would say uh, who say that no this uh, is actually in agreement with theory and the uh, the other uh, maybe bigger groups say that no there is a problem uh, right now it is something like uh, to take the earlier experiment like four sigma or and a half sigma difference between theory and experiment so anyway so the point is that uh, many of these uh, theories which can make very precise predictions uh they can they are uh, you know probed by experiments and so these experiments have to also develop methods to uh, go to that kind of precision and this sometimes might take uh, years and years to do uh, for instance the uh, the brookhaven i think result came out in the late 1990s uh, uh, around 2000 and this result has come out about 20 years later okay sometimes experiments are also done to observe phenomena that were actually not uh, predicted by theory uh, there was no theory regarding this and so uh, further experiments are done to you know, pin down the aspects of that uh, finding the earlier finding and uh, you know build up the body of data so that uh, eventually they can be understood in some uh, theoretical framework and this happened in the case of for instance radioactivity which was observed by becquerel he took uh, salts he found that 
he was actually trying to observe some other phenomena with the uranium salts. But incidentally, he found that the photographic plates, which were kept close to the uranium salts, they got uh, whitened, so to speak. So they, they got activated by this. So then he tried to investigate them, uh, you know, put things in between, and found that uh, you could get shadows on the uh, you know, films or the plates. And uh, that's how then this was taken forward by the Curies, who uh, actually you know, found uh, evidence for something which was there in the uranium salts, but at a very low level, and they concentrated that, and ultimately it led to the discovery of radium. So the radium was uh, something like a million times more active than the uranium salt itself. And that's how then it, this actually began the uh, revolution that measurements of radioactivity, alpha decay, beta decay, and so on, then quantum mechanics and relativity. So, now, uh, when I talk about measurements, uh, as I said already the, uh, in the beginning, uh, we will talk about these in maybe a little more in detail, but a careful and accurate measurement means that the two types of errors are small. Namely, the statistical errors and the systematic errors. The statistical errors uh, are related to the fact that, uh, you know, suppose you are producing a particle. If you uh, have only 100 particles that you are dealing with, then there is a statistical spread in those. And so when you measure any quantity, you don't have those many particles. So there is an, uh, there is an error due to the, just the fact that there aren't so many particles. Of course, in the measurement itself, you might have errors. So suppose you are measuring the momentum, then you might have an error in the uh, momentum measurement, in the energy measurement, uh, and so on. Uh, but there are also, uh, you know, some measurements which are not kind of uh, continuous. Uh, you know, the, the, the quantity that you are measuring is not a kind of continuous uh, quantity in the sense that you might have something like 5.65 uh, or something. Instead, and some other, uh, in a, some other situation. Uh, that particle might give you some other number. Okay. Now, uh, on the other hand, there are some kinds of measurements that are of the binary type. So, for instance, if you ask whether the neutrino is a Dirac particle or a Majorana particle, you can only get one of these two. Uh, it is very unlikely that it is both Dirac and Majorana. Okay. Uh, so, most likely it will be either a Dirac particle or a Majorana. Uh, now, for instance, in the picture that we have of the neutrinos, that there are three mass states associated with it, is we know something about uh, two of those mass states they are ordering, but the third one we do not. So is that mass hierarchy normal? Uh, M1 being the smallest, M2 larger than that, M3 still larger, or is it that M2 is larger than M1 but M3 goes below M1? So that's the so-called inverted hierarchy. So these are kind of binary statements, uh, whether. Uh, and and it should uh, there are experiments to try to find out whether it is one or the other type. Sometimes they may be extremely difficult. Even if it looks like a binary proposition, uh, it may be extremely difficult to decide which is which of the uh, who is the correct answer. Uh, for instance, the neutrino was proposed in 1930, uh, but we still do not know whether uh, 90 years later whether it's a direct particle or a mirror number, whether the neutrino is its own antiparticle or whether it is not its own antiparticle. So, sometimes it can take a while to decide uh, what uh, the answer to the even a binary type of question is. Okay, now we come to uh, error. Sorry, yeah, somebody was asking a question. Yes, sure. I have two doubts like, uh, yes. what do you mean by Dirac particle and Rana particle? Okay, just hold on. Uh, by Dirac, you mean that there are four complex numbers that describe a, a Dirac particle. I mean, if it is spin half, okay? So, a spin half particle such as the electron, it has four complex numbers. So, that's called a, a, a spinner representation. Uh, but a Majorana particle, because you have two for the spin uh, states, okay? Two of them arise from the spin. Uh, of the uh, of the electron uh, because it is half, so it can be plus half, minus half. 
uh, but it, you also have the antiparticle. So the positron is different from the electron. Its charge, for instance, the positron charge is plus, right, positive, whereas the electron charge is negative. So the other two numbers describe the positron. Okay. Whereas a neutral particle, uh, in I mean, what would you have if it's an elementary particle? What is it that distinguishes? A, a particle from an antiparticle, certainly not the charge. So it is possible that so for a neutral particle, which is fundamental, it could be its own antiparticle. So then you have only spin, spin plus half and minus half. So if the neutrino is a Majorana particle, then you can describe it with just two states, two complex numbers, right? So that is a simpler description of the neutrino if it happens to be Majorana. And the Majorana proposed this, I think, in the mid 30s. I don't know, 33, 34, or something, or maybe in the later. But certainly in the mid 30s, around that. Uh, Sir, how does that answer your question? Sir, sir. Like you said, how to differentiate between particle and uh, antiparticle for a neutral particle? Yes, yes. By spin. So, no, no, spin is, is a different thing. I mean, if, if you have an antiparticle, it can again have spin. Right? So, uh, but what distinguishes a. Okay, uh, let me give you a counter example. Uh, we know certainly that the neutron and the anti neutron are not Majorana particles. Okay, because neutron, neutron is not the same as the anti neutron, it has a baryon number of one. Of course, that we infer from the fact that we actually have these two particles. You can create these two particles and then they can annihilate. Okay. Uh, so, a neutron will consist of a U, D, D quark and uh, uh, anti-neutron will consist of a U bar, D bar, D bar quark. Okay. So, a neutron is not a Majorana particle. You know that. I, I, I don't know uh, the term direct particle and neutron, Majorana particle. So I know now, uh, like Majorana is when we have different particle and antiparticle. No, no, when, when they are the same, when the particle and the antiparticle are the same. See, That's for Majorana. instance, yeah, yeah, then, then you call, I, I think, I also don't know whether it's used in uh, other contexts other than spin half, maybe it is, but uh, in the spin half context, certainly a neutral particle could be a Majorana particle, uh, provided it is fundamental. Uh, a neutron is also a spin-off particle, but then it has its partner in the anti-neutron. Okay. Uh, so it's not a... If the particle is charged, then of course the question doesn't arise, right? It Because then particle and anti-particle have different electric charges. But they could have some other charge which is different. So for instance, the baryonic charge could be different. So for instance, there is the delta. There is this uh, uh, neutron is of course an example of that. Uh, I think there are other examples. I, I, I can give you maybe in the I can update this if you like uh, some examples of uh, neutral particles which are not there in mind. Neutron comes to mind first. And, and I have one more question. Yeah. You said sure. Sure. Uh, my new magnetic moment of mu. Is, of, is, the muon, of the muon, of the muon. Muon is uh, it's in today's news. So yeah, I want to ask, like, you said that it's related to QCD. How like muon is a lepton and QCD we talk about. Yeah, what? so so in higher orders it can make uh, you know uh, it can give rise to a, let's say UU bar pair, right? And that effect has to be taken into account. So you see in in quantum uh, I mean. In relativistic quantum mechanics, you can create particles. As long as you are doing them for a very short time, you can create any number of heavy and uh, heavier and so on particles, right? So just as it can emit a photon, which can get reabsorbed, it can emit a, a photon which breaks up into an electron-positron pair, combines, and then again it uh, combine it uh, uh, combines with the particle okay. itself. So there, there are all these higher order uh, corrections, right? So called the, the vacuum uh, is an important part in uh, plays an important part in calculating these higher order effects because the vacuum can be you know quite complicated and just as you can make electron positron pairs which then annihilate and uh, you know give you uh, it comes back 
uh, to the original state, the Myanmar comes back to its original state. You can also have, uh, you know, quark, anti-quark pairs. And so there, then QCD things come. Right? That's how QCD enters. Okay. So but it's in an indirect way. It's true. But since you are calculating a very, very tiny effect, see, after all this, uh, uh, I mean, according to the Dirac theory, this G should have been exactly 2. Okay. However, it is not 2. It is 2 point something, some 0, 0 and some small correction. Okay. That arises because of these vacuum corrections. There are, uh, there are uh, you know, higher order effects uh, which are related to the vacuum, which cause uh, deviation from G minus 2. Otherwise, G minus 2 should have been 0, but it's not. And the beauty of it is that these can be calculated. So right now, there is a small problem. I mean, it may turn out that this is a uh, this is a premonition of something big. It's possible. Uh, maybe we have to, uh, but we have to wait and see. It might be that you know there are some higher. Uh, uh, there are some. That no, no, there's no problem at all. And so then the theory has to go even better in order to you know, test theory to even harder. Is that okay? Can I proceed? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sir, 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 I have a question. Yeah. Sir, uh, so uh, neutron and uh, anti-neutron can be distinguished uh, with the uh, base of baryonic number. So, yes. uh, so uh, that assumes baryon number can be measured. measured. Of a particle. Uh, yes, yes, it can be measured uh, again indirectly from uh, uh, you. What you do is you have a let's say a reaction where you know the initial baryon number. Of course, that has come about because you know you are trying to understand various kinds of reaction. Okay, so you have some picture right. in your mind that okay, this has baryon number. You ascribe baryon number to uh, the quarks and then the conglomerate of these quarks, which are basically hadrons, and then. Uh, you say that mesons don't have any baryonic number, but uh, okay, uh, the nucleons and their yeah. excited states and this one, they have baryonic number. And then you look at the right hand side. Okay. So, right hand side, what it goes into, uh, the reaction products, uh, you know, let's say the uh, quantum numbers of some of those, and then you can ascribe a quantum number, uh, in this case, the baryon number, to some particle that was, let's say, newly discovered or something. Okay. Now, of course, that has to match with other data. If it doesn't match, then maybe you have ascribed it wrongly. Okay, okay. Yes. So things like that. So it's a body of knowledge that is built up, and uh, everything has to be consistent within this picture. That's the idea. So, for instance, if the neutron and anti-neutron are particle and antiparticle, okay, then the magnetic moment of the anti-neutron should be opposite uh, in direction to the uh, uh, to that for the uh, neutron. So, the neutron, for instance, G factor is uh, negative, okay? It's some, uh, uh, I forget the exact decimal places, but it's of the order of minus 5 or something. So, G factor times spin is the magnetic moment in terms of nucleonic uh, uh, mu n, okay? The, just as you have the Bohr magneton, you can, you have a nuclear, nuclear magneton. And so, it is, I think, uh, something like uh, 2.7 or something like that, but minus. Uh, minus 2.7 nuclear magnet. Whereas the uh, neutron would have an opposite of that. Okay. Because a neutron is made up of, of course, uh, non zero charges, right? It is a U D D. Now, in the other one, you have U bar, D bar, D bar. So the distributions in this that led to a magnetic moment are uh, having opposite charge. So it will have an opposite uh, magnetic moment. Indeed, that is found. Okay. So, I mean, there are other evidences also which uh, tell you that uh, it's a particle and a particle. Okay. okay. So shall I go ahead? Okay. So let, let me come to this uh, uh, errors. Okay. First of all, I would like to uh, you know this is again a matter of semantics, but 
these words have uh, you know uh, specified meanings uh there is a distinction between accuracy and precision very often in uh, you know in our common conversations and so on we use them interchangeably okay you know, sometimes we oh it's a very accurate uh, uh, accurate thing uh, accurate measurement or you say oh it's a very precise measurement and we mean the same thing but actually in in science they have different meanings okay uh, accurate measurement of an observable means that it is actually close to the real value of that observable okay a precise measurement is one where you repeat it you repeat the measurement again and again and it will give you a very accurate number uh, sorry uh, it will give you a, a very precise number uh, it will not have a large deviation okay that doesn't necessarily mean that it is accurate because there can be an overall error for instance let me give you an example if let's say i have a scale where the zero itself is wrong okay suppose i start my scale at let's say to give to exaggerate it i start it at half a centimeter okay and i have all vernier calipers and all that i can make it down to 0.01 mm and blah blah okay however i will get a very precise measurement but that will be completely in error it won't be an accurate measurement because i have forgotten about that uh, half uh, centimeter offset that was there so uh, that's the difference you you can uh, another example that comes to mind is this um, is the hubble telescope apparently when the hubble uh, you know the mirror was made it was made very precise i mean down to i think lambda by 100 or some such extremely precise image but there was an overall error in the curvature that was supposed to be there and it was wrong okay so it was not accurate to the you know the intended uh, curvature that it was supposed to have so it was precise but not accurate so this is the this is the difference between accuracy and precision and so any measurement that we would like to make we would like to make it Uh, and we would like to make an accurate measurement. Uh, of course, we, by doing so, we would need uh, uh, precision in the measurement, no doubt. But we have to take care, as I said, of all these other uh, errors that can happen, uh, so-called systematic errors that might give you a completely wrong uh, measurement. Uh, obvious things are, of course, something like uh, you know an offset in the measurement of the voltage or current. Or, you know any measure uh, but there can be much there can be things that are much subtler than this and uh, they sometimes will be very hard to find for instance okay another example that comes to mind is you might have heard uh, uh, some time ago i think it was about 7 or 8 years ago that uh, a neutrino experiment claimed to have uh, measured neutrinos moving faster than light okay had that measurement been uh, accurate and had that measurement uh, been borne out by other experiments this would have been archaic but uh, i mean you would have to go back uh, and uh, change uh, einstein's theory of special relativity perhaps the general theory and so on. uh however it turned out that although the measurements of distance so the the way this uh, uh, the velocity of the neutrino was measured was you basically need to know the distance it travels at the time it takes to travel right so you have to have precise clocks you have to have very precise measurements of the distance so it turned out that distances were measured very accurately because now we have the gps systems i mean even if you you know for uh, example let's see uh, they started from two ends uh, i mean uh, in two opposite directions and came together i think within millimeters of each other uh so they they uh, made a tunnel, tunnel uh, which was about 26 km long but they when they came together uh, and broke the wall they were the centers of these two tunnels were uh, right to within 2 mm so very very precise and also accurate uh, 
they could have been very precise. Each one could have been within millimeters of what they intended to be, and the other guy could have been so. But if they had been, let's say, 10 meters off, then this would have been a precise measure. I mean, we are doing things, but not at all an accurate, very poorly accurate, poor measure, poor uh, setup that did it. So uh, anyway, so the point is that in this neutrino velocity measurement, they use GPS to get a very accurate measurement of the distance. Time measurement, they also use cesium clocks. They match these clocks at the same place, then took it to the other place, so the source and the place where it got detected, they were measuring this time with nanosecond accuracy. But it turned out that some cable somewhere was actually giving a larger delay than it was supposed to. And so it was a very precise measurement, but not accurate. And then they actually found the error and they, uh, fortunately it was not, uh, it was I think published in the archive and when they found this error, they retracted that measurement. So uh, uh, everybody heaved a sigh of relief. You don't have to worry about uh, special theory being wrong, special theory related to it. Okay, so these are just a few examples of uh, the difference between accuracy and precision. Okay, now when you make a measurement, there will always be scope for an error okay, in the measurement. For instance, if you do that with a scale, let's say which uh, students in class use for making measurements of distance, uh, you know that okay, a centimeter there will be 10 uh, lines on that and so you can make a measurement correct to maybe plus minus 0 0.05 of a right? If you have a you know a more accurate way of doing that, you could do that maybe to uh, a tenth more precision. Okay? But you would still have an error associated. You, you will say that okay, it is uh, 15.5, uh, let's say 55 or something, 15.55 uh, centimeters or 155.5 mm plus minus 0.5 mm. Okay, so you would ascribe an error. And that is important because uh, no measurement is uh, perfect. Okay? There is always an uh, error associated with any measure point. It could be, uh, you know, that error could be a large fraction of the, uh, you know, the quantity itself. So you could have 10 plus minus 5, then it's a very poor measure. And uh, so if you had only two markings on your scale, which was, let's say, 20 centimeter long, then of course you would make a very poor measurement, right? But uh, if you have you know, uh, but a more precise instrument, you could uh, make a more you know, precise measurement and then the error associated with that would be smaller. Okay. So, when it comes to errors, there are two kinds of statistical errors. One is, uh, these are kind of random errors. You make a measurement on some, let's say you make copies of some object which is uh, some given length. You make perfect copies of it. But let's say you measure it, your friend measures it, and some other friend measures it, and let's say 100 people measure it, you will find that they will not necessarily measure the same number. They, they will not have the same answer. So if you uh, look at the so-called uh, root mean square deviation, so you can always take a mean of these measurements, that uh, there will be not too much of spread around that mean measurement, if, uh, given the, uh, the accuracy that we have or like precision which you all have, uh, but there will be a certain amount of spread. And that spread can be quantified in terms of a so-called root mean square deviations. Uh, and uh, that is uh, given here as sigma equal to summation over the, the measurements that you have done, AI. Uh, there could be some kind of a number of measurements. So I goes from one to, let's say, N, where you have made N, N people have measured this, or we have measured it n times. Uh, even if, if an individual makes the measurement uh, completely independent of the previous measurement, you will find that you will get a slightly different number. And uh, this especially uh, <coughs> is true of, let's say, uh, measurements of things like radioactive decays. So suppose I have a uh, you know some radioactivity which is giving you, let's say, 100 gamma rays per second. Okay. Now, if you do it uh, for a certain period, let's say for uh, 10 seconds, <clears throat> then you get a number like 1000 on the average. But 
if you do it again you will not exactly get 1000 you will get some slightly different number and so on and uh, these will actually follow a poisson distribution if you will come to the next slide but certainly if you take all of these measurements together you can find a mean and you can find a root mean square deviation so this is on the average how much uh, the uh, the number of decays per second uh, deviate okay. uh, if you make more and more measurements this will become a smaller fraction of the mean so if i plot uh, if i if i let's say calculate sigma by the mean okay which is this the average i don't know if you can see this here this is in pointer options is the point okay. ah so here uh, so this this is the mean uh, of that observable uh, the measured observable and this is the uh, root mean square deviation sigma so if i plot sigma by this mean then i will get smaller and smaller numbers if i make more and more observations usually that will be so okay. if it is all kind of statistically distributed uh the accuracy will increase uh, if uh, the statistical error is a fraction or uh, fractional error will decrease as i make more and more variables so uh, for instance were you to look at the same example of radioactive decay then they follow a poisson distribution so suppose i have uh, the, let's say mean number of decays per second per minute or per hour whatever the case may be and that is lambda then this poisson distribution that i will find a number k in that same interval of time for which i have estimated the mean uh, mean number of decays let's say for example then this will follow a distribution p of k given by lambda which is this mean uh, to the power of k e to the minus lambda by k factorial k and k is a integer so if the mean is let's say 100 it is very very unlikely that i will get 0 or 1 but if the mean is let's say 2 then it's uh, i mean the probability that i will measure one decay in that interval <coughs> is not insignificant okay uh, similarly 2 3 and i can uh, if i go to 10 of course that probability will be very low okay uh, so anyway this distribution can be calculated and uh, uh, this is a plot uh, taken from wikipedia uh, where uh, lambda for a few values of lambda the probability that you actually get uh, <clears throat> some number of events in the interval that you wanted uh, is this plotted here so if for instance the mean number of events in let's say a time interval but it could be something else uh, is 1 then the probability that you get 0 is as high as the probability that you get 1 and then it drops probably your 2 is smaller 3 is still smaller and so on so this is the poisson distribution that you can calculate for that if you have let's say lambda equal to 4 then you have a small probability that you have no events occurring in that time interval no decays you have one decay two decays and then three and four of the same probability five is smaller and so on and you can see that this is fairly asymmetric it is close to zero right but as you go higher and higher this starts approaching symmetry the, the left part of it is more or less like the right part and indeed if lambda is very high then this poisson distribution is more or less like the uh, normal distribution of gaussian distribution okay so uh, no before i go here i should also point out that if the number of uh, measurements is sufficiently large then it follows the so called normal or gaussian after gauss uh, the great uh, mathematician gauss who wrote on this wrote on many many other things in mathematics and in the sciences uh, so this is named after him it's also called normal distribution so this probability distribution uh, is uh, some normalization factor an exponential of x minus the mean uh, that means you can get measurements of various type It's a continuous distribution. Means you can get x, uh, which is smaller than x m or larger than x m, and uh, this squared by two sigma squared, and then the exponential. So this I don't know whether I have a plot of that. I don't think I have. 
but this is a kind of uh, symmetric distribution about Xn, more or less. Okay? Uh, but uh, X can go from in principle minus infinity to plus infinity. But in practice, of course, some of these may not be allowed depending on what your observable is. And uh, so then it might be a sort of truncated Gaussian distribution that you have. And this uh, normalization factor, of course, can be computed because the probability distribution, the integral of that has to be 1. So you can compute this depending on what uh, uh, this, uh, sigma is. Okay. So now let me go to the other aspect, which is a much more difficult. So if you make measurements many, many times, you get these sort of so called statistical errors. And they are, uh, uh, I mean, reasonably uh, easy quote-unquote, to uh, estimate. Okay. On the other hand, the, the much more difficult part is uh, so-called systematic errors. And uh, the systematic errors arise because there are uncertainties in the you know, experimental setup. So maybe in the efficiencies, maybe in the parameters that you use for uh, you know converting a observed quantity to a physical quantity that you might have to compare with theory and so on. And there might be many, many uncertainties in the intervening calculations because they might uh, depend on some amount of theory that is said. So uh, whose theory are you using and so on. So these contribute to so-called uh, systematic uncertainties. And these are often, uh, I wouldn't say always, but often quite difficult to quantify and to estimate. And, uh, they could, as I said, lead to a very precise result being a very inaccurate result. It is possible. Okay. On the other hand, if you are, uh, uh, I mean, if you are very conservative, then you will try to estimate these errors. In fact, give more leeway to those systematic errors, the, the things that you don't know about, and so on. That you would increase the error bar and try to make sure that the, if you were to reduce these systematic errors, that the quantities that you measure would still be within the error bars that we have put in your experiment. Uh, this somehow I do, because I don't think I would necessarily talk about that. The example of the Indian experiment is the experiment. It is stuck from somebody else like that. Okay. So, Sometimes it might be necessary whether a set of measurements or simulations is consistent with the statistical system. So, what you could do is you could break up this data into, let's say, 10, or depending on how much data you have, into more, 20 such experimental runs. And you could see, uh, you could look for the derived quantities, extracted quantities from each of these runs and see if there is a statistical spread okay? or uh, you know the systematic errors that, that you have contribute to an even larger spread than what you expect from a statistical distribution. Uh, so that, for instance, could give you some idea of what might be the systematic errors. And this is actually something that we did in one of our experiments. And uh, it uh, is uh, sometimes, uh, I don't know, Again, because these systematic errors are rather difficult to deal with, it may not be possible to always figure out whether you can estimate them. And even if you have made an estimate, you don't necessarily know that these are uh, you know, the, the best estimates of the systematic errors. But uh, you know, depending on the uh, on the experiment, you, you have to decide experiment by experiment what are these systematic. In some cases, perhaps they are very small. Uh, if, they, if the design of the experiment is very good, uh, it will be, it will be small. But in any case, any experimentalist would have to quote what is the statistical error and what is the systematic error. And quite often, it happens, at least in low statistics experiments, it certainly happens, that the systematic errors often outweigh the uh, statistical errors. I, 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 sorry, I put it the other way. Uh, you might have uh, you know, very good statistics, but you might have a situation where the systematic errors are the dominant and statistical errors are small. 
So experimenters always would like to have a situation where at least this things that you can control, statistical errors are within them. And systematic errors, of course, one would like to see what are the possible ways in which you can be in error and try to control those. Okay. The other aspect, very important aspect, and this actually sometimes does contribute to systematic error, is the calibration of instruments or the apparatus. Level. This is extremely important um, because suppose you are measuring, let's say, uh, the energy of a particle. Now, the energy of the particle is often uh, done through uh, calorimetry. Which means that you have some signal in a detector which is proportional to the energy deposit in that detector. Now, sometimes it happens that this is not a linear relationship. You might deposit two times the energy, but you might not get a response from the detector which is two times. So the signal may not be two times as high. Okay? Let's say in terms of voltage or in terms of total charge uh, and so on. Uh, it might be that the detector itself is linear, but the amplification process, uh, that might be non-linear. Of course, nowadays that uh, usually will not happen, but it does happen sometimes. So, there could be non-linearities, which are, uh, so you would have to correct for that. So, this involves calibration uh, of the detector. So, you have to have, uh, you know, a known energy particle coming in, falling on the calorimeter, let's say, for example, and you have to measure the signal and you can change the energy of that particle. You have control on that and therefore you can uh, look at the signal. And even if it is, uh, if it is linear, great, but even if it is non-linear, if you have mapped this uh, relationship between the energy deposit and the, uh, you know, the signal that you have uh, in terms of amplitude or charge and so on, then the contribution to uncertainty from this source will be small. Okay? And you can quantify that. You can say that I know the calibration to this extent. So uh, the slope, let's say, of such a curve, uh, if it is linear, then it is uh, that slope will have some small uncertainty. And that uncertainty will actually uh, translate itself into the energy uncertainty, depending on what energy particle you are measuring will be a small answer. So that you can quantify. Um, so, okay, I have given an example here. For instance, uh, an energy sensor output might be amplified and the amplifier gain might drift. Now, it might drift because of various reasons. It might drift because some, you know, some voltages in the amplifier are changing. Uh, they may change uh, uh, due to noise or they may also change due to temperature. Uh, the ambient conditions and so on. So, of course, you use normally things which have less temperature coefficient. I mean, they change less with respect to changes in temperature, but there would be some uh, dependence and so uh, these could arise from that. So, the ultimate test, as I said, is you have a known energy falling in on your detector and you measure its output. So, then it takes into account uh, uncertain, I mean, the drifts that are there in the detector itself or in the amplifier, or even in the data acquisition system that you might have. Okay. Uh, maybe when we come later, I will tell you roughly, uh, give you a block diagram and see what is involved in that. So, uh, as I said, the sensor output could change with ambient temperature, but it could also change due to humidity, due to magnetic field, and so on. Now, the, many of the high energy physics detectors use uh, magnetic fields, but uh, for instance, low energy detectors, they could even be affected or photomultiplier effects could be affected by even the Earth's method. So, you have to take care of that by shielding these uh, uh, photomultipliers from the Earth's method field. So, so, or there might be fringe fields coming about because you have high magnetic field in the detector and if you have photomultipliers which are not so well shielded, then a change in the magnetic field could affect the gain in the photomultiplier. There are all these... Uh, things that can happen. Okay, to give you an example, for instance, of how you would calibrate. So, suppose you want to measure the magnetic field in a dipole magnet. Uh, actually, I forgot to put... Uh, maybe I'll show you 
subsequent plans. Okay. For instance, uh, I hope all of you know that uh, a Hall probe is something that you use to measure magnetic fields. So what is a Hall probe that is shown in this figure? So you have basically a DC current going through the Hall probe. Then you have a magnetic field in a perpendicular direction, as is shown better here. This is, uh, this is the source of this picture. So let's say a current is flowing in like this. This current, of course, uh, corresponds to the usual convention that we have of positive charges. Different. In many cases, it is actually the uh, you know, electrons which are moving. Okay? Uh, but in semiconductors, you might have, uh, I mean, the majority carriers might be electrons, they might be holes. So you indeed can have holes. So anyway, the arrow refers to the current uh, as uh, we normally uh, the conventionally uh, put, uh, namely the positive charge from uh, right here to left. And the magnetic field is this way. So then the, I mean, one way of looking at it is that you have the current force. So a Q cross uh, Q into V cross P. Uh, so, the V corresponds to the drift velocity of the charge and V is this magnetic field and you will see that you know, the charges uh, actually drift to one side and they will keep drifting till the, the charge accumulation is such that uh, now this opposes the drift, uh, the bend in the, uh, in the drift. So, then uh, you can compute a voltage for that and voltage is related to the condensed matter properties of that uh, object material that constitutes this whole probe and so that's the uh, the voltage that you see is proportional at least in, in the low field regime to the uh, magnetic field and uh, the proportionality constant is called the Hall coefficient. Okay? So when you want to measure let's say a magnetic field with the Hall probe you need to calibrate this instrument. So you need to take it to a place where you know the magnetic field from some other consideration. Uh, so this could be that uh, you have used, let's say, an MR frequency to probe it, uh, and then measure in the same device uh, the Hall voltage. So now you can you know from the NMR signal what is the uh, what is the magnetic field, and then you can translate uh, that to the Hall voltage. So you have a calibration between the Hall voltage, and you can do this for various uh, you know. DC currents here, so that you, you see what is the relationship between the uh, current and the uh, voltage, that's one. But you could also change the magnetic field and see for a given current, what is the uh, Hall voltage. That so both of these could be done and basically this calibrates the instrument. Now you can take this uh, uh, Hall probe to wherever you want to measure the magnetic field. Uh, actually had a Somehow I can do it. Uh, Ani had actually sent me a series of plots in the last moment I was going to put it in, but I forgot. Maybe next time I'll show you this plot. Start. So uh, you can calibrate this uh, Hall probe uh, in a standard uh, or in a device where you know the magnetic field. Form. Again, that has to be uh, standardized, so it will be a secondary standard. Of some primary standard. This could be done, as I said, in the NMR probe or something, or you could take it to a place where uh, it is a primary standard. So you take the whole probe to a primary standard. And by the way, these primary standards are something that uh, are something that are there in the so called uh, institute that keeps track of these standards. And that, in the Indian context, is the National Physical Laboratory in Delhi. So they, uh, they keep standards for various kinds of instruments, uh, lengths, uh, you know, mass, then time measurements, they have these atomic clocks, or you have uh, magnetic field standards, uh, electric field standards, and so on, a host of uh, things that they have. Uh, so NPL, the National Physical Laboratory, is the place where all these standards are and so. If you want to make sure that you are doing the right thing, you can go there. Of course, there might be things that are well known. I mean, uh, things like, for instance, what is the uh, proton uh, nuclear magnetic resonance? So that is dependent on just the properties of the proton, and they are universal. 
uh, you need not necessarily go to uh, you know uh, NPL to measure uh, uh, NMR signal corresponding to a proton spin clip. Okay? Uh, provided you take the right kind of uh, material, let's say water, one such, then you know what the frequency is. Because of course, this NMR frequency is also, uh, I mean, slightly dependent on the environment that it has. Uh, in water, for instance, it would have one kind of environment. If you take a proton, let's say, let's say paraffin, it would have a different kind of environment. If you take a more complicated organic molecule, it would have. A but these are have been well studied and documented. Uh, these can be looked at, and so if you use NMR as a cross, uh, you know, reference then you don't necessarily need to go to it. But uh, it might be good once in a way to go there, and check out what you thought was uh, a certain magnetic field is indeed so, even according to that. But they are the ones who are authorized to keep these standards. Okay, so this is as far as uh, the all probe calibration. But you could also, for instance, uh, calibrate, uh, a, let's say, a current source. How do I know that something is, uh, you know, so many amperes? So what is done is you have a precision resistor and then you measure the voltage. Of course, this voltage has to be measured uh, not just precisely but also accurately. And uh, uh, one of the things, of course, that uh, such a precision resistor, the voltage drop across that does and is actually put to use is by giving a feedback to the current source. So for instance, if the current tends to rise, and this is called negative so if the current somehow because of some temperature variation rises, then the voltage drop increases and then this basically feedback goes to the DC current source, it basically changes a small uh, voltage in a transistor and then reduces the current so as to bring back this to the set value. So what it does is this voltage that it measures all the time uh, across the precision resistor is compared to a reference voltage. which if you alter, you can change the DC current that is going through the DC. So when you want to change, let's say, a current from uh, 0 to 10 amperes, you change this reference voltage that you are giving. So this is, uh, uh, this is not uh, shown here, but this uh, voltage drop across the precision resistance is compared to the uh, value that you set, and that difference uh, goes back uh, to the DC current. So if that difference is large, then it changes the DC current in the, in the right manner, in the right phase, uh, so that to bring back the current to the value that you want it to set. Okay. Similarly, I had take one other example. I think I'm going uh, much slower than what I had uh, thought I would, but it doesn't matter. Uh, take up whatever I did to now in this lecture, the next lecture. So, okay, for instance, another example. Perfect. Hello, sorry. So sorry, yeah. ask a question, sir. Yes, uh, sure, sure. Previous uh, slide. Yes. Uh, so, is the precision resistor is a passive resistor or is it also an active device? Well, it could, in principle, be an active device, but then uh, uh, I think in at least in the earlier cases, uh, okay. Uh, what you are asking, I think, as uh, uh, you are referring to maybe a kind of uh, digital uh, way of doing it, right? Maybe, maybe that's what you're referring to. But no, no. in the early days, there would be a precision resistor with a, you know, pa parts per million or something temperature coefficient. Uh, and there are there are resistors, there are there are materials which have a very low uh, temperature coefficient. I don't remember offhand what that is. But for instance, I think manganin falls in that, uh, at least comes close to that category. Uh, so if you have a wire which is bound uh, on a constant, uh, at a constant temperature. so. First of all, there is the temperature coefficient is small. Then you also take care to put it in a you know bath which is maintained at reasonably constant temperature. So then the precision resistor, uh, its resistance doesn't change. Okay, that's the idea. But I guess this could be done if you have a very stable. I mean, uh, uh, let's say uh, this current goes. Uh, I don't know if there is some active device whose uh, properties you are. Uh, uh, very sure of maybe that's possible. I, I don't know too much. Okay, but the resistor is certainly an approach that was taken in the early days, and that works. Thank you. 
So incidentally, uh, to the other uh, members who are uh, looking at this uh, uh, attending, uh, Dr. Satyanarayana is an electronics, uh, I mean, he has an electronics background. He, he started out with a BE in electric, electronics engineering, and then of course he did a PhD in physics. And so, uh, I mean, uh, his question was uh, quite interesting. I, I really don't know the answer to that. So, I have to say that uh, it might be a stupid answer. I'll try to look up if there is any uh, any active way of doing this. Okay. No problem. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, let's take... Uh, sir, sorry. are you recording uh, the lecture, sir? Oh, I didn't record the lecture. I completely no, I forgot. Don't see, I, don't ah, see I, can, I completely forgot. I completely just now forgot. I came from uh, the other meeting, so... Okay, okay. Uh -huh. came to your meeting just no, no, I, I had that in my mind, but somehow uh, after I started, I completely forgot about this. But, okay. From, from next, here, from next from, here, uh, from here you can do it, okay? From here I will record it. Sir. Okay, okay, fine. Sir, I have this I have meeting is being recorded. Okay. Yeah, so somebody was asking. I have recorded it. Oh, you have recorded it. I have okay. recorded it. Very good. Very good. Very good. I have screen recorded, so I have the record. Started. Okay, great, great. From the beginning, I have recorded. Okay, Excellent. great. So maybe uh, we, we can put it up on. Huh, we can put it up on the uh, appropriate site or something. I mean, I don't know whether in Mad Science or I know or whatever. One of these sites will. Put. No, this uh, I know YouTube page. I was planning to. Put oh, up. okay, okay. We could so put I it up. You. So I request so, uh, so who is this? Who, 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 who is recording? Yes. So she can't. Yes, okay. yeah. And could you please uh, share it with Dr. Satyanarayana? I will send you. I will send you his email address and so on. Yeah, I'm putting up here. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're putting it up on the chat. Chat yes, box. Yeah. It's just bsn at tfr dot okay. okay. So let me continue. I okay. I think we are close to coming to one o'clock, right? So maybe I should wrap up. Uh, I'll just talk about this and then we'll stop. Okay. So let me come to a very, uh, I mean, simple example of calibrating an array of detectors. And by the way, this is representative of the much bigger calorimeter, like uh, gamma ray calorimeters that are used even in high energy physics. Okay? Uh, for instance, uh, the leg tongue state or uh, other types of uh, scintillation detectors that are used. BGO, for instance, was used in LEP in one of the experiments. Uh, but this is quite, uh, I mean, this is. Uh, smaller versions of those big uh, arrays. Uh, but this gives you the idea. Okay, so this is an array that we have used in uh, Mumbai at the Electron Linac facility to make measurements of, uh, we call them high energy gamma rays, but in the context of particle physics, of course, they are not really high energy, they are low energy. But let me just specify what the energy is. So uh, the idea was that we were measuring gamma rays from a, a few MeV, 3-4 MeV, to about uh, 30 MeV or so. Okay? Uh, if you go still higher, then of course the electromagnetic shower penetrates deeper and with the thickness of barium fluoride that we have, uh, we wouldn't catch all of the electromagnetic shower. So the barium fluoride detectors that were used in this case were about 20 centimeters, okay? that's about 8 inches uh, or 200 mm thick. And uh, they had a face to face of about 9 centimeters. Uh, so uh, these were in the form of hexagon, the cross section was a hexagon. So you can pack these hexagons in a close pack geometry. You have a central guy and you have six guys around that. And uh, you know, they, they're modular. So that uh, if you had circular detectors, then there would have been gaps. There would be holes in between uh, uh, you know, these detectors. If you have hexagonal uh, uh, I mean detectors, then uh, the gap is uh, just limited to, or the dead zone is just limited to the thickness of the housing which encases the barium fluoride scintillator. So there is barium fluoride scintillator, there is a thin aluminum uh, casing so that uh, it protects the detector, uh, both from the humidity and uh, so on. And then uh, after these are closed packed, then around that we had a, uh, a uh, thermocol uh, sheet. Thermocol is some you know, packing material that you have, uh, which is a very good insulator. Uh, I mean, a commonly occurring good insulator. Of course, there are even better insulators, but this is rather easy to fashion in the, in the, in the shape that you want. And so this is what we had put around the barium fluoride array. And then outside of that, we had a, uh, you know, an annular detector in which we had 
plus six centimeters, and I will tell you uh, what the role of that has been. And then uh, above uh, around all of that was a uh, was some lead brick uh, sheet. So lead, as you know, uh, is one of the heavy uh, metals with also reasonably high density, uh, density of about eleven point three or something. Uh, whereas iron, you know, has a density of about seven point nine or so. Aluminium has a density of two point seven. So this is uh, lead is very high density, and also it has a high Z. Uh, its uh, atomic number is eighty two. So uh, <coughs> the Amare backgrounds, which exist, uh, you know, in the lab, they can be very well shielded with this uh, lead, uh, with this uh, arrangement of lead bricks. Um, okay, so this is the front view of that, and uh, on the other side. Uh, on, the, on the back side, we of course have photomultipliers, which are collecting the light uh, from the barium chlorides and uh, giving you photoelectrons, and then the photoelectrons are multiplied by the photomultiplier to give you a signal which is typically a million times higher, and so on. And then you process that. And uh, barium chloride has the property that it has a very fast component, uh, scintillation component, so you can get excellent timing from the barium chloride. There are other scintillators like. Sodium iodide. In fact, that was the first scintillator that was, uh, you know, um, inorganic scintillator that was discovered by a Nobel laureate called Hofstadter, who made electron scattering measurements on Ti yeah, and so on. Uh, but uh, the barium fluoride does not uh, doesn't have the same light output, but it has a fast component, which so is much faster. There's a 0 0.6 nanosecond decay time. So in fact, that is so fast that uh, the photomultiplier that we use actually slow down that signal to some extent. So, any case, so it can be used for so-called time of flight measurements, and uh, so anyway, so this is what we use them for. So, I'll just show you a. Uh, yeah, I should, uh, okay, so these are the energy spectra in a single barium chloride in just one of those uh, hexagonal uh, cross-section detectors. So, the uh, how do you get standard energies? Uh, okay, those standard energies come from uh, known, uh, commonly used radioactive sources. In the field of gamma ray spectroscopy, you use 137 cesium and you use 60 cobalt, and then you can also use, uh, you know, uh, americium beryllium sources to give you a higher energy gamma ray, 4.4 uh, MeV gamma ray in uh, carbon 12. There is an excited state there, uh, and those gamma rays can be used for calibration. Similarly, in oxygen 16. There is a state at 6.05, and uh, that you can produce by uh, having a radioactive source of alpha, which is plutonium in this case, and carbon 30. So you get the alpha N reaction and it goes to that state in oxygen 16, which depopulates by that 6.05 in gamma. So you can see that this is the response. Of course, there is a background because you know there are this source also leads to. Uh, I mean, this gives rise to the alpha N reaction. So the neutrons then interact with the projector to give you a kind of continuum background. But you can certainly make out these peaks, and you can identify the peak positions, and so you can make a calibration. Okay. Uh, so low energy, and high. Energy. So this is in the region of <coughs> 0.66 MeV. This is in the region of 1.2 MeV. <coughs> Sorry, this is 4.4. Now here, you see that the response is not just the peak at one place. This is the so-called single escape peak. That means <clears throat> this uh, gamma ray produces electron-positron pairs. Since they are charged particles, they lose energy. Uh, and then the positron uh, annihilates against one of the electrons in the detector, producing two 511 kV gamma rays. And the, one of the 511 kV gamma rays, for instance, can escape. If both get detected, then you get the full energy. If one of them escapes, you get the so-called single escape peak. So that is 511 kV less than this. But that's good. You know, if you know what it is due to, then that, that's another point of calibration. And finally, of course, there is the double escape. If, if the event occurs, let's say, close to the edge of the detector, uh, let's say one of the corners of the detector, then both of these gamma rays can, both of these 511 kV gamma rays can escape, and uh, you will get a double escape. Of course, the probability of that happening is somewhat smaller. So we have a smaller intensity there, uh, but it, but it's uh, it also 
something that happens, then you can use it in the calibration. This, uh, in the case of the 4.4 MeV also, because it is above the 1.02 MeV threshold for E plus E minus production, you again have this uh, full energy peak, single escape, and uh, double escape. But notice that in this case, of course, it is riding a background, but the single escape, if you compute the intensity, is a little more in the higher energy case than in the lower energy case. So anyway, you can repeat the same procedure for some spectra and uh, you can compute what is the resolution and so on. Oh, I don't have a, I, I thought I had a calibration. Sir, I want to, can I ask you a question? Missing. Yes, sure, sure. Sir, uh, yeah. in the case of uh, the previous plot. Yes, the previous one, yeah. Uh, yeah. Why the uh, why the uh, width of the distributions uh, are as they are uh, for single double escape? Uh, why they are broader, for example, double escape? Uh, uh, okay, so, I mean, you're, you're saying in terms of percentage. Uh, I mean, they're not, okay, they're not inconsistent with a one by root e behavior. Okay? Because the oh. pulse rate is slightly smaller, so I, that's what I, I should have uh, put in that plot as well. Where uh, So they're not inconsistent with that, but, uh, I mean, I, it is true that I have not, there is also a background that you have to subtract. Uh -huh. And the background is more in this case uh, than in the other case. So there is a tail which is actually changing. Okay. So uh, I think if you if you account for that, then the resolution actually match uh, the one by root behavior. One by root. So I have a plot of that, and okay. uh, they reasonably match that behavior. Okay. Okay. So uh, of course, when you have this array, you have to match their gains either. Uh, so to first order, we do that by actually changing the gains of the amplifiers. Uh, but uh, you cannot match them exactly. In any case, even if you did that, they would drift slightly differently with temperature. And incidentally, barium chloride has a large temperature coefficient. It's something like uh, minus 2% per degree centigrade. So that is why all this paraphernalia of thermocoil and uh, trying to see that the temperature remains as constant as possible. Okay. And, uh, but in spite of all of that, uh, you you can match it only to a certain extent. So the full width that I have maximum for these uh, these peaks uh, are somewhat large, okay? larger than individual, for that, that for individual detail. Okay? Uh, but as I said, it goes roughly like one by root e still. And of course, the other thing that happens is when you sum up the signals from these uh, detectors, then the single escape uh, intensity decreases slightly, right? And that is because uh, that 511 can actually get caught in its neighbor. And so when you sum up, you have brought it back to full energy. So now you see that the full energy peak is certainly more than the single escape. And the double escape has, you know, is very small. It has gone into background. Maybe it's there, but it's very hard to identify and less so even for the 4.44. So, I think I shall stop here. It probably is an appropriate place to stop. And uh, uh, we'll meet next Thursday. If you have any questions at the, uh, at the end, please, uh, you, you can please ask. Uh, so, maybe I should uh, unshare my slides. Okay. I'll do a stop share. Yeah. So I'll put it to gallery view. So all of you are there. Okay. So uh, if you have uh, questions, do ask them. If not, you can uh, also. Uh, I I should have actually given my. But you have my email address, right? Because I any anyway communicated to you by email. So if you have any uh, questions that you can you thought of later, you are. Uh, most welcome to write to me uh, by email and uh,